Good evening, everyone. My name is Rachel Miller. Uh, I am the Chief of Archive and Library Services for the Center for Jewish History. We are home to the largest and most comprehensive archive of the modern Jewish experience outside of Israel, comprised of our five partners' collections here. And we're really grateful to one of those partners, uh, the American Jewish Historical Society, for co-sponsoring this event with us tonight. And I'd like to welcome those of you who are joining us here in person, as well as the many more of you watching via Zoom. Uh, for those of you in the room tonight, uh, please remember to keep your mask on at all times in the auditorium and only remove it for eating or drinking at the reception afterwards. So we are here tonight with several members of the Zabar family to celebrate the publication of the wonderful new book, Zabar is a Family Story, written by Lori Zabar, who sadly can't be here with us tonight. Uh, as we had originally planned. And I would like to share my condolences with the family uh, and thank them for honoring her memory and her work by holding this book launch at the Center for Jewish History. First, a little bit about Lori Zabar. Uh, she was the granddaughter of Zabar's founders, Louis and Lily Zabar, and she was an arts, architectural, and decorative arts historian, a historic preservationist, and a retired attorney. She was also an independent curator and consultant after many years as researcher in the Metropolitan Museum of Art's American Wing and Modern and Contemporary Department. Here with us tonight are several members of Lori's family. Uh, Lori's father, Stanley Zabar, son of Zabar's founders uh, and co-owner of Zabar's. Lori's brother, David Zabar, uh, the executive director of Zabar's. David's son, Willie Zabar, social media coordinator for Zabar's and host of the Zabar's podcast. Uh, Lori's daughter, Marguerite Zabar Mariscal, who is the CEO of Momofuku, M Ma I'm sorry, <laughs> Momofuku, uh, the culinary brand and restaurant empire founded by Jeff, uh, Jeff oh my God, sorry. Jeff David Chang, uh, and Lori's son, Henry Zabar Mariscal, who is uh, part of not only the Zabar's family, but the Center for Jewish History family as well. Um, he is a sheer joy to work with here at the Center as a visitor services associate, and he has worked for many nonprofits in the past, and although food is not his career, he still enjoys food just as much as the rest of the family. <laughs> The Zabar family will be in conversation with Julia Moskin, a lifelong uh, Upper West Sider, who has been a New York Times reporter for, on food since 2004, uh, writing about the restaurant industry, culinary trends, and home cooking. She was part of the New York Times team that won a Pulitzer Prize in 2018 for reporting on workplace sexual harassment uh, and for her investigation of the spotted pig in New York's West Village. Uh, she also wrote the foreword to the book. So thank you, Julia, for agreeing to join us and be part of this event. Um, after the conversation, we will take some questions from our in-person audience, and then we will have a reception with the family in the Great Hall. Uh, thank you to Zabars for providing the babka and rugula for our in-person audience this evening, and apologies to those of you at home who are without babka and rugula. <laughs> For those of you here uh, who did not purchase the book uh, when you got your ticket, there's still a chance it's not too late, uh, and they're, be, they're sold at a discount of 20 bucks right now. So thank you all for being here and for joining us, and I will now turn it over to Julia and the panel. Thank you. Thank you. So are our mics on? Yes. Okay, good. Um, well, first, Henry is going to talk a little bit about the process of how the book came about. It's a book that many of us have been waiting for for years, if not decades. It's really the first um, authorized family history and cookbook with actual Zabar's family recipes. Um, and I was very honored that Lori asked me to write the foreword. Um, so Henry's going to talk about that. Then I'm going to read a little bit from the book because it is beautifully written and extremely moving. I'm going to read a little bit of the account of the pogrom that she wrote. 
and then um, I'll just we'll just chat for a while, and there'll be 15 minutes for questions at the end. When uh, you don't need to get up, there's not you're not going to come to the mic. Um, someone will hand you a mic, so you'll just raise your hands, and I'll call on you. Okay, that is done. <laughs> so Henry, please start by telling us how the book came about and how your mom did, um, especially the archival research. Yeah, sure, absolutely. So my mother felt that this was a very important conviction for her to start this project. Uh, she felt that the history of the store and our family would be a very fascinating story um, that should be told um, and that many people from many backgrounds and different um, cultures could relate to. Uh, especially, you know, coming from, like, escaping a country to coming to the United States and starting over and starting something new. Um, and, you know, she eventually did talk to about it with Saul and Stanley, my grandfather, and David, um, and they wisely agreed to do so. Um, and that really was the start of that and the catalyst. Um, in terms of research, uh, she... We've already always denied the right to write book about uh, Zay bars. Uh, we've had many inqu inquiries, and we're pr very proud of what came out of what learned. Right. Insider information, right here, <laughs> yes. Uh, but yes, it, it eventually, they agreed, and it, they don't regret it at this point. Um, and, in tr and in terms of research, um, I mean, my mother was a very professional historian, researcher. I mean, even when she was an attorney, she was a research lawyer, so she has t had a ton of experience, and she went through, you know, not just, and she did do a lot of it here at the Center for Jewish History, where we are tonight, uh, archival records, genealogy, um, Hayas records, ship manifests, and beyond that, she also went into, you know, um, magazine and newspaper articles, videos, and also interviewed as many family members as possible, just to get as much information as she could. And, and she, she did finish the manuscript. And she it did was all finish it. And, yeah, yeah, it was all done. I mean, she really, I mean, I think the only gripe she had is that the index wasn't fully done, but anything, but everything else, <laughs> but everything else was done. She really did such a thorough uh, and fantastic job. And I'm glad that she can, now it's gonna be shared with everybody. And she died only three months ago. Yes, and that's right. We missed, uh, missed this meeting, which everyone would love to have seen her. Yeah, um, she, yeah, Stanley, yeah. try holding the mic, oh, oh, the mic. when you're talking. When you're talking? When you're talking. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. She, uh, it's only within th the last, she died three months ago from uh, a, a cancer uh, and uh, I'm, I must uh, tell you that my uh, youngest daughter, uh, Sandy, who uh, kept her alive for an extra couple of years as a uh, head doctor, one of the head doctors at the NYU. Uh, and uh, we're, very proud of, we're very proud of everybody in our family. We really have a great uh, group. As, that's true. We do. That's very true. So, um, well, I met Lori um, only briefly, and it was because I also was one of the people who wrote to her and said, have you guys ever thought about doing a book? <laughs> and she said, well, it's a little late. Um, so I didn't get to work with her very much, but I, her work is extraordinary, as you all will know when you read the book. And one of the reasons for that, and one of the reasons I'm sure a lot of you are here tonight, is because it resonates with so many stories of so many Ashkenazi Jews, including me, and I'm sure many other people here. And since the beginning was set in Ukraine, I'm sure that's also on the minds of a lot of people tonight. It's so troubling to see those images again that so many of us were told by our parents and our grandparents and our great grandparents. Um, so I just wanted to mention that because I think Lori would have mentioned it herself. Um, so first I'm gonna read from the book. Um, okay. So we're in Ostropolia, am I pronouncing Ostrop it correctly? Oh. Ostropol, Ostropolia, Ostropol. and um, Stanley's parent, uh, Stanley's father, Louis, 
uh, lived in Ostropolia, which was in the Pale of Settlement near Lviv in Ukraine. Um, and his parents were Shlomo and Malka. And this is set in uh, 1920 after the war. So, For a week in September 1920, beginning on the eve of Yom Kippur and extending through Sukkot, Louis nervously watched the retreating Bolshevik troops tramp through Ostropolia. Cossacks allied with the Red Army arrested the town's Jewish leader to extort money from them, even though many Jewish residents were already destitute. They looted stores and literally took the clothing off people's backs, leaving them naked and barefoot. The cries that arose from the streets terrified the Zabarkas and their neighbors as they huddled fearfully in their homes. Zabarka was the original name. On a cold day at the end of Sukkot, the Zabarkas listened as the sound of clomping boots came nearer to their house. Then the front door was thrust open and a band of armed Cossack soldiers, accompanied by local thugs, marched into the living room and demanded money. Shlomo complied as quickly as he could, hoping they would move on. But then several soldiers approached Malka and began groping her body. When Shlomo tried to shield her, one of the attackers became enraged and thrust his sword into Shlomo. As shots were fired and the blood began to flow, eight-year-old Archik, who was one of Louis's seven siblings, right? They were eight in the family. Eight-year-old Archik slipped through a window to safety. Rose hid under a bed in a back room. Malka was frozen in shock, and two neighbors named Benjamin and Abe, who had been in the house along with the Zabarkas, tried to run away in the chaos. All three were shot. The two men died in the house, but Malka, shot in the face, managed to stay conscious as blood poured out of her. 16-year-old Khanna, who had been outside when the shooting started, ran into the house and screamed when she saw her father slumped on the floor, the two dead men, and her bleeding mother. She was immediately shot dead as well. Louis, who had been outside during the melee, heard the shrieks and ran into the house through the back door to retrieve the rifle he kept him, sorry, the, the contraband rifle he kept hidden under his bed. Obviously, Jews were not supposed to have weapons. As the soldiers and bandits exited the front door, my grandfather chased after them, shooting as he ran. They shot back, but Louis was able to dodge the bullets and escaped into a nearby cellar where he hid for several days. Louis was told that Shlomo had bled to death hours after the attack and that Hannah, Benjamin, and Abe had also been killed. He knew that his attempt to defend his family and his possession of a contraband weapon had made him a wanted man. He would have to flee Ostropolia. So, it was a very eventful life. Well, it's almost the same as we're hearing in today's news. That this is Russia killing and, and doing these, these uh, horrible things, and then with the a threat of atomic reaction, if we, if we try to do uh, major help uh, beyond what we're doing now there. Yeah. So it's very, very difficult to understand what these type of people really want. Well, it's not just in the past, you know, the legacy of, of that experience is, is still playing out in Europe, but also on this stage um, in, in, in better ways. And it's, uh, it's uh, not known, we had no knowledge and involvement uh, in this, uh, knowing that we would be involved in a similar situation due to the, uh, the writing of the uh, book. So did, um, did your father talk about that experience? Well, not too much. Uh, we we uh, had part of it. I think uh, David uh, got some uh, information about uh, the past and uh, um, everybody heard part of the story, but she brought forward many, uh, much information that we didn't uh, realize or know about the various groups of family and so on uh, there. And being about a hundred and some odd miles away from Kiev uh, made this a, a, current, uh, uh, a current event here. Uh, David, do you have anything to say on that? You know, most of what I heard started with his arrival here and finding Lily and starting their business and their family. And really until I saw the book, I wasn't aware that he had to flee and that he was being pursued or what those actions were. And I don't, 
Your father didn't talk about it very much, and I don't remember hearing it at all from before. So I don't know if Lori had heard about it or not. I think her research. Uh, a lot of it came uh, in the research. She found some letters, and, and so I had it retranslated uh, letters that she had taken care of, and this whole story came out, and she was able to follow, uh, follow it through records of, of the various Jewish groups, uh, non-Jewish groups, of what was happening. And weren't there some interviews of your father, maybe as he passed through... Uh, the rest of Europe on the way out that they actually documented his story somewhere uh, somewhere he met a, a relative in a, in uh, uh, Canada which is I think it's mentioned in the in the book and how uh, she, he found a document that had uh, documented some some of these things and we uh, we through the family we found material there I think she put it all together to get what this book is about. So Louis and, uh, was it Louis or, Lu or Louis? Louis? Louis, my uncle was Louis. called Louis, yeah. <laughs> so Louis and Lily had known each other in Ukraine, and while they didn't make the journey together, they found each other here, which is remarkable. Um, do you think that affected them in their determination? They went through so many setbacks in their business. Um, you know, they started uh, with several, with a grocery store and then expanded and there were fires and there were trials and there was going to jail for price fixing, which was very interesting. <laughs> and a number, uh, there's so many setbacks. Do you think it, that experience had made them more determined? Well, I think it was part of her, uh, of his background. If you read the, in the book where he was, uh, uh, his father had, uh, uh, a, um, uh, a lumber yard and uh, uh, selling uh, of, uh, wholesale f uh, and retail fruit and vegetables and various things that connected to what he, what Zabar's really turned into. You have to get the pieces and put it together when, when uh, you know when you hear some of the information or you read about it there. But uh, yes, he, he had a tough background there, and uh, it's uh, uh, very amazing that uh, when he, it was a heavy smoker uh, here, and so in, in when he became uh, uh, cancer, uh, lung cancer, uh, when he was uh, about 47, and uh, by the time uh, he was turning towards 50, he didn't want to live that uh, way. And he, he was, uh, we were very proud about, at that time, my uh, older brother uh, knew the head of American Latex, uh, a son of American, the head of American Latex, who was bringing in a chemo from, uh, uh, from uh, Switzerland. And uh, he was on this chemo for about a year, and um, it stopped the uh, the um, uh, the water to, for him going into the lungs, uh, the buildup uh, of the lungs and water. And he felt they told him that the American brand would be much better, and the chance that he would be much uh, fine. So. He uh, didn't care about the risk, so he switched, and within uh, three months, he was dead uh, through water uh, filling the, the chest. Uh, so uh, none of us uh, uh, became smokers, uh, as you can see. Yeah. That's, uh, yeah, it's an amazing legacy for someone who didn't live to be 50. It's really remarkable. Um, so obviously, the question that I've always wanted to ask all of you is, do you get to just run around the store and eat whatever you want? <laughs> but we're going to be a little bit more organized, and I realize we haven't really talked about the food that much yet. So, um, Willie, why don't you start and tell us what your first job was at Zabar's? Um, my first, first job, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, we used to sell these novelty magnets in the mezzanine. I don't know if anyone remembers. Make some noise if you remember the novelty magnets we used to sell. Yes, we gotta bring them back, okay? This is my evidence. Um, so we sell little magnets, you push, some of them had little buttons and they made noises. And when I was maybe three or four years old, uh, my dad would be working in the office and, and doing the payroll 
and he would say, like, Willie, just, like, stay in the mezzanine. Bernardo, watch Willie. Uh, Bernardo's still there. And I would just, like, organize the magnets and, like, open boxes and put them up, which means the knife was involved at some point. Uh, and but how, then at the end how of it, old were you at this time? I what? was probably four, right, Dad? What do you think? Four? He was, he was working. I don't know. He doesn't know. He wasn't there. Uh, but at the end of it, he would give me $5, and I was like, oh, I work today. Uh, <laughs> it was uh, child labor. <laughs> okay, Henry, what about you? Um, actually, my first job was for a summer job. I was 15, um, and you're not allowed to use, technically not allowed to use knives or sharp objects until you're about 16 when you're there. So I was behind the Kanish counter. I was Strudels, Blinson. I can only just hand things out. Um, and it was a really interesting experience because I felt like that was my first you know, adventure into customer service, which I still do today. Um, and you learn Have you that ever encountered customers as difficult as the Zabar's customers? Um, <laughs> not, no, probably not. Uh, well, they're, they're very special. I mean, they think they're very special, and they are. Um, I definitely learned that where you, depending on where you work, every customer is different. Um, and, you know, we, and especially at Zabar's, we have a very special customers that, you know, so when they sell, we have to sell Blinson at a minimum, because uh, it's a weight minimum. And a woman came up to me, and she's you know, a bit older, and she said, I want one Blinson. And I said, well, it, there's a weight minimum. I think I have to sell you at least two. And she just looks at me, and she's like, like I said something horrible. And she's just like, but I'm the customer that comes every day. And I learned that is a very common thing that happens there, um, and in many places where you work. So I thought that was a really good learning experience. But what did, did you get her one blintz? Yes. Well, I talked to the managers first and <laughs> they said, oh, we know who that is. No worries. She can have one. It's okay. So, you know, you have to sort of um, go through, you learn who everyone is and you learn um, how to treat every customer individually through that experience. Okay. Um, should we, let's skip Stanley. I'm going to come back to you, but Marguerite, let's talk from, hear from you. Um, I had a, a similar experience to Henry. I, I think I was 15 or 16, and I was a cashier for a summer at Zabar's. Um, and I believe I wrote my college essay about it, but that's as much as I remember about it. <laughs> if my mom was here, she would have known exactly what uh, I wrote about, but that's as much as was it, my memory Was it stressful? Hold. I mean, the cashiers are very good. Yeah, I wasn't as good as, I would say, the, the people that um, are, are lifers, but... Um, it was interesting. I think you, you learned about you know a, a wide array of different people coming through the store that you got to see, um, and it was definitely uh, not easy. But I think it prepared me for everything I've done since. David. Well, my first job, my uh, Stanley and I would drive into the store Sunday mornings. Maybe it was every other week. From where? From Queens, in the oh. Rio Park, and uh, his job was to to open Sunday mornings. Someone else closed Saturday nights. Yeah. Bring the mic closer. And Saul Zabar, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> uh, so, and we'd drive in and we'd pick up the Russian coffee cake at a, at a bakery. This is about 7 o'clock in the morning. And then we'd come into the store. And then during the day, I would, sell, I would scoop coffee beans and sell coffee cake. And as I said, you, you weren't supposed to handle slicing machines or you know, very involved things until you had your working papers at uh, 16. So that was that. And what Willie mentioned about doing the magnets, you know, there was always the, the children could kind of have the run of the store because you knew where they were. Yeah, really close. There, you had, that there are always employees sort of watching out for the children. And in the book, it talks about Saul and Stanley could always go to the store if they needed the key to the apartment or if they needed lunch, I know. Eli would walk to the store from grade school to get lunch and back. It's, you know, it's a, it was a family center for all generations. I, can I just add something real quick? Um, so you get your working papers at age 16, and then at age 18, you are qualified to use the slicing machines. In case anyone from OSHA is watching, <laughs> please keep that in mind. But you could also get your working papers at 14 and 15. You but can. that's a little more limited. The, the point is that it's not till age 18 that we start using the slicing machines. So has anyone in the family ever been allowed to slice fish? I don't think anyone. What was the question? 
You mean at what age? Or well, no where? one's mentioned ha actually touching any food. Well, uh, we, I think we all uh, had to at one time slice. Uh, <laughs> we, Thank we, you, sir. At all time, at some time during the uh, our uh, lifestyle in uh, New York, we had to slice fish. Uh, so we did slice it, but there was not. Uh, we were not experts at it. Maybe, maybe David was. Well, let me just say, Willie, after his career in Struls and Knishes, and I assume he was 18, did work behind the deli counter. So he became a delicatessen. -er. Right, and deli counter is the prereq for the fish counter. That's a real thing. So, no, the best, the best workers, uh, if you move up from the deli department, you're entrusted with the fish. Because, as I've learned, if you cut the fish wrong, it costs the company money. Okay. So you only trust, like, the best. So when I returned from college in my 20s and I went to work full time at the store, Saul thought I was a good candidate to be the smoked fish purchaser. So I became the apprentice fish purchaser and I would work behind the counter Sundays and Mondays and then I'd be in Brooklyn and Queens inspecting and purchasing smoked fish you know, Wednesday and Thursday, and, uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday if necessary. So yes, I've, I've had my time behind the counter. Two of my sons, uh, Daniel and Michael, they both had worked full time on the appetizing counter at some period. Uh, any any relative, friend, or necessary person who was competent and pleasant and needed a job, we always found a place somewhere at Zay Bars during their growth and the time. And if they needed funds to get uh, to medical school, to other things. So we were a fairly close uh, group of uh, family and, and people who were in, uh, in need uh, there. Uh, but one of the things, a couple of things that always stood in my mind was when we moved to, uh, from Brooklyn, uh, when I was uh, two years old, and uh, we moved to Amsterdam uh, Avenue and uh, 81st Street. Uh, we were in the brownstone walk-up, and I always uh, watched the ice man carry up this chunk of ice to put in uh, an ice box uh, that we had there. And my, uh, my uh, great, wonderful wife would always say, we never had that. We, we had a, a refrigerator. <laughs> and we were uh, on, uh, on the poorest side of, uh, not the poor, no. She was on 93rd 90, uh, 90, uh, Street uh, in uh, East Side. Her father had a, a, uh, a, a store, a candy store that sold newspapers. And they knew uh, how to... Uh, to deal with the wealthier customers there that needed their 10 cent uh, newspaper immediately uh, there. Uh, but she, she was uh, just a wonderful uh, uh, person uh, in, in dealing with all these things. So we, uh, I'm saying this because in June we will be, have been married uh, 70 years so, uh, <laughs> and her life in in education has been that Hunter uh, College was very important to her, and a, a fabulous uh, during the early times was only for women, smart, strong, healthy, intelligent women. And then they let in the men, which they uh, were, were then, uh, and the artists and the so on. So she's a great artist and involved there and has been supporting Hunter for all these years. Well, as let's, um, speaking of women, maybe Hunter we should College. talk about Lily a little bit. <laughs> well, uh, so what was Lily's role in, in the business? Did she work in the store? Uh, uh, Lily, uh, well, we, uh, uh, I'll tell you a little later, the, 
that uh, Lily worked with my father all the time, and uh, uh, she did the, uh, the cooking and they created uh, uh, recipes and and uh, the gefilte fish, and, and one that we were talking in the outside before we came here, that one day I walked into uh, uh, an apartment in 81st Street, I'm going to tell you later about how I lived most of my life in going uh, from Amsterdam to West End Avenue, and that's most of it on 81st. Uh, and so uh, one day I walk in uh, to uh, the apartment and I go into the bathroom and it's full of these big carps, big fish. fish. And I got very scared. I, I was a little uh, uh, boy at that time. I said, Mom, what's in the, the, those big uh, animals in the... In the <laughs> She says, uh, it's coming to for uh, Passover. We'll need gefilte fish, and if we don't get it early, there won't be enough uh, carp around. And so, uh, that was my experience with gefilte fish in the beginning. <laughs> uh, but my mother, uh, uh, my mother uh, was uh, a partner with my father at all, all times. Uh, uh, she claimed that uh, she, they, she got us out of uh, Brooklyn by uh, someone coming in, uh, which we, we're not completely true. Someone coming in and saying, hey, would you like to sell the, this fruit store you have in Brooklyn? And, and she said, immediately, and, uh, and she sold it from under my father's nose. <laughs> but we, uh, that's a whole story we would have. But we moved to 81st Street in, uh, uh, right after that, and uh, um, well, it's part of various other stories. Did you want anything else? So she, um, so the recipes, the original things that, like the, re the recipe, fish that you still have. She has the, a recipe. Yeah. And, uh, Some of them what, are in the book as well. She, she, she made cookies, she made, uh, she cooked, she uh, did all these things. And as she got older, uh, let's say uh, in her late 80s or so on, she didn't put in various, said, well, I shouldn't have too much sugar. So it became at home. These are, she was no longer working in the store, but she was always making uh, dinners and wanting everybody to have something. Have my, my, some of my cookies, have some of my gefilte fish, have some. But she, uh, as she got old, she left out parts that she used to have. She says, it's better, it's healthier for you. <laughs> so, David, you've really grown up in the business as well. Um, I am old enough to remember the era. I'm wondering about what the, ch the biggest changes that you've seen over the years, because I'm old enough to remember the Marie Klein era, where there was so much food and amazing smells. And you can still smell the coffee from the sidewalk, which is great. Sure. I think everyone on the Upper West Side was very rattled when Eli moved to the East Side. That was, everyone was very concerned about the family at this time. So was that a big change? Um, just what are, what? Well, well, well. <laughs> it's for David, this is the question. Oh God. Oh, well the biggest change in the store and is that I'm, came in full time in the mid 80s, was uh, creating self-service. You know, now they call it a home meal replacement. Now you can buy you know, a, a salad and the, mm -hmm. the protein, everything in, in one container. And so when I s say in 82, behind the appetizing counter, behind the appetizing counter, if you wanted a quarter pound of cream cheese, someone scooped the cream cheese. If you want a half pound of chopped liver, they scooped the chopped liver. Right, you had to wait online separately in each department. Uh, right, that. to, to yeah. get those things. Uh, and, and of course we went into pre-cutting the cheeses and wrapping them and labeling them. And the biggest transition, and you would see it especially on the Jewish holidays, uh, Yom Kippur, we'd have three, 400 numbers out waiting. People, people sitting on milk crates and, <laughs> and no one was happy. The customer wasn't happy. The men behind the counter couldn't work fast enough. You, know, you couldn't take a break. And then as self-service came in, uh, customers had the option of taking a number and waiting. And there was the option of getting what they needed. Cream cheese, gefilte fish. Uh, 
Like the most popular items. And, you know, of course, we developed the, the pre-sliced salmon vacuum packed. And, that was and, really and, brilliant. I mean, obviously now it seems very obvious, but... Um, well, now, but we worked right. very closely with the smoke houses <laughs> and we selected the product and we sampled it. And, they, you know, it took over... We're talking about 40 years now to, to create the, the product we have now. And... Uh, you know, One thing very important that David and Saul, who I hear is in the audience here, <laughs> uh, 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 is the quality of the product. Uh, the quality was the most important uh, uh, situation. If we had too much of it and, and it would be subject to uh, lack of uh, life still, we would uh, either give it away immediately or we'd sell it or we'd dump it. But we, with the product, it was, was very important to us. And so um, that's, I think everybody here uh, understands that quality is, is, is the basic need in food. Uh, to I want to ask actually Marguerite then, because you now work with a restaurant group that is known for its changes and um, innovations and the ways that it you know, changed fine dining. Um, so it was the first place to have backless stools for a really great meal, um, the loud music that plays in the, I mean, none of that, of course, is characteristic of Zabar's, but how do you think your work at Zabar's prepared you for working for what is now really a very big food business? Sure. Um, so I, I mean, I think working for Eli, working for Zabar's was a huge part of, of preparing me. And I think, you know, you could make a comparison where I think, as you were just saying, at Zabar's, it really is about the quality and, and at Eli's stores as well. Um, and I think what Dave was trying to do at Momofuku is basically strip everything down to just like basically delicious food ev over everything else. So you don't need to have a sommelier, you don't need to have a white tablecloth, you don't need to have all of this uh, kind of noise. Um, the food itself can speak for itself. And if that's delicious, you know, nothing else matters. Um, and you know, I think that's evolved over time, and I think you know that was kind of the point that needed to get made, and now we're finding the balance on that, um, especially with different price points. But I do think, at the end of the day, I mean, if you look at at Zabar's, it's almost like, and something we actually do a lot at the restaurants is using kind of the basic forms, like what's like the design of Zabar's is essentially like how much stuff can you fit into a, a physical space, right? And and just kind of the like cornucopia of stuff, and you know the. Um, you know, the floor with the, the sawdust, like all of it is, serves a purpose. It's really kind of like, how do you get people through? How do you, um, you know, uh, merchandise everything and, and really making the food, not just, you know, the thing that you're taking home that you eat, but also making it that, that's the visual, that's like the aesthetic, that's what you're coming for. Um, and I think, you know, places like Zabar's really pioneered that. And I think for a lot of our restaurants, we tried to do the same where the design is the, you know, a glass refrigerator that has everything that you're gonna eat for your meal. Or, you know, the, the aesthetics are really like all of the things that go into what you're about to eat. And I think uh, Zabar's was kind of at the forefront of that. Well, going back to uh, the, uh, the book has many recipes. Where did the recipes come from for the book? Who? <laughs> some of them came from Lily. Lily. Uh, some of them are adaptations of the store's recipes with maybe like a couple changes. Uh, and then, I don't know. Does <laughs> anyone else? Anyone read the are, book? I read the book. All right. There, there are only 12 recipes in the book, so uh, and I think I most of them I are... understand, uh, this is not my part, but I understand every recipe was checked and sub-checked and, uh, and dealt with uh, within the family. And I don't, uh, within the family, whether outside the family, I don't know. But I understand they're very good. And uh, and and they're, and they're copyable. So if you, if you buy it or get it or or look at it and copy it, enjoy. <laughs> All right, I want to do um, a lightning round, Henry. If you had to choose one Zabar's food, if you could only have one for the rest of your life, what would it be? That's a tough one. Um, 
Honestly, I would probably say the, the cured salmon, the Nova, the Novi, because no that is, that is, <laughs> well, that's like from my childhood. Like I would go to the store, my mother would take me and she would do her shopping and sometimes she would, you know, I'm busy shopping and you know, like much like Willie was watched by someone. Um, I don't think my mother made me have watched by them, but I would hang out by the fish counter a lot while she was doing her shopping and we have a fish cutter who's still there today, James, and whose name, last name is uh, escaping me. Yes, thank you. Uh, Uncle Ira, thank you. Um, and he still tells me that story. He'll be like, oh, your mom was busy, and I would just slice and feed you Nova Scotia, you know, like a seal, like just like, like you're just hanging out. And I'm sure your mother was very annoyed with that and be like, why are you spoiling his dinner? Um, well, it is a beautiful but, thing to watch the slicers work. Oh, I thought, it, yeah, it was beautiful and they were so nice and kept giving me more. So I think it's just a staple for me when I think of the store. It's the, it's the fish. Definitely. Okay. Willie, Willie, what about you? Oh, definitely coffee. Royal blend. Mm, which roast? Royal Blend. Royal Blend. Or Royale, as we spell it, but don't say it. Really? <laughs> it's spelled, my brother Danny says, it's spelled Royal on some things, Royale on other things, and we will not change it. Oh, and what, um, we were in a uh, French-Italian roast, I believe my parents are here. Uh, we were a French-Italian roast family. What's the Royal Blend? What makes it special? Oh, it's just, it's so good. It's like mm -hmm. a blend of different beans. Uh, you can I'll, grind I'll, it and make a beverage out of it. It's real good. Uh, I'll address that. Sorry. So it's a quarter Vienna Rose, which is our light espresso, and three quarters Continental, which is sort of our darkest regular roast. So it, it, it goes into the espresso area, but less bitter and more full bodied. Okay. You ever bring shame to your father in front of a room full of people? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'd like to say one important thing about the, most, uh, the biggest seller, if you can consider it in any store, is the amount of coffee that is sold by Zabar's. They roast uh, approximately 8,000 pounds a week, which uh, roasting reduces the amount of uh, of coffee, so you would say between six and seven thousand pounds are sold per week in Zebras. And why? Why is that? Someone asked, "Why are you so specific to my brother Saul, who developed this coffee uh, operation?" Which is a whole story where I won't take too much time. And he says, "My interest is to make the coffee as if you're creating a fine wine." And that's what, uh, what it is, and weekly, uh, uh, only towards the last couple of years that he has trained uh, David and other, certain other people in the operation to follow his uh, creativity in coffee. And so uh, we have probably the best, uh, and the quality of the coffee is higher than those that you would pay three or four times the value for. That's our opinion uh, there. So that, that's coffee. It is. And the other parts would be uh, the uh, having the, uh, we call it the deli department. But it's really, uh, we have, how many chefs do we have, David? In the kitchen? In the kitchen. Uh, about 30 different people working in the kitchen. Uh, and so these, uh, uh, these are very important to us. And we have uh, great chefs. We have people who are uh, interested in quali quality and ability to have things that are reasonable. Uh, and if you ever go in the store and look for something for uh, two people for dinner, can be quite reasonable and uh, delicious. <laughs> yeah. All right, David, what's your favorite? Uh, my favorite is a uh, roast beef sandwich on a hard roll. But, but one that's just been sliced and then hasn't been in the refrigerator, you know, hasn't... It's, you know, right out of, you right do out of it the and oven. You make it and you, you eat so it. So this is or, something or, or, we or can't with, within, a, you know, within a, an hour, you bring it home and you make the sandwich. And if you want, pile some coleslaw on it. But that, that's the tops as far as I'm concerned. You're a man of simple tastes. <laughs> I, 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 I like to, as long as he mentioned that, uh, the, uh, one of the greatest 
items in this store. A great sign is the uh, rye bread that Saul, uh, my brother here, uh, developed uh, uh, that is the most delicious a product and what would do, do what my wife uh, does. She buys the whole, she slices it, freezes it, and then we toast it and it becomes as if it's uh, uh, just just baked. And it's such a flavor uh, that uh, where Saul got that idea, he never told anybody. It is great. All right, Marguerite. What's your one sure. life lifeboat desert island a bars food? Um, I, I I guess generational thing. It is definitely the smoked salmon. I would say for anyone who routinely gets it from the case, I highly encourage everyone to take the time and wait for it to be hand sliced because it is like genuinely. You're gonna completely disagree with me on this, but I think ten times, oh, twenty yeah. times better. But. I, I, I've had meals with my grandpa where he says they taste exactly the same. So well, they might taste the, the same, but like you can't read the New York Times through the stuff that's in the that's in the case. <laughs> the hand slice is definitely the way to go. Can I make a comment? Um, because as you all know this. An appetizing worker and the fish buyer is that when we we have guests for brunch at our house, I'll go into the store at nine o'clock, nine ten in the morning, and have the nobi sliced because just like the roast beef. You bring it home and you serve it, it's totally different than vacuum packed, refrigerated, or even the same thing the next day. So that's, it's an experience. No, that's a really I point. disagree. <laughs> <laughs> uh, though, though I might be splitting hairs. <laughs> As the okay. uh, producers of the smoked fish have moved to uh, the south, where they ship to most people uh, this packaged, uh, uh, sliced uh, uh, nova, or salmon, uh, the, they have three uh, groups that they sell in New York. Uh, they kept uh, some of the plants in New York for producing uh, smoked fish. And those, we can, we can actually direct uh, how much salt and how we can change uh, different things. And I would say that within the last couple of months, the uh, pre-packed salmon, sliced pre-packed salmon, is almost, almost <laughs> as good as the, it, unless you, as David says, unless you get it and uh, this morning and you're gonna, within a couple of hours, going to have company, and that, that you can't beat. So. Uh, I, I'd like to comment on that. <laughs> yes. It's a debate, people. I, I agree. I can't it's, do anything. Yeah. <laughs> I, I do believe Zabar's slice product is, is, is the best out there, and because we're looking at the dates and the controls and when it came in, and I was in a local supermarket recently, and they had packages of smoked salmon, and they had more than six different producers all hanging there, and I'm looking for date codes, I'm going, how do you control this, you know, randomly in a supermarket? You know, maybe Costco has more control, but I think Zabos has the best and the best product, so I think... Right, you know, and it, it's it, become it's, a place where you can actually shop. It's not just an appetizing store, now you can shop for your family, as I know, and buy dinner and the pre-made stuff. I would like to put in a word for the rice pudding, which is extraordinary. <laughs> and uh, with that, we are going to open it up to your questions. Um, we'll bring up the house lights in a sec. And um, you can just raise your hands and uh, Julie will bring, you, will bring you the mic. Oh, someone in the middle, I'll just hand up first. Hello. Uh, may I make two quick points? Uh, just to show what a small family we uh, Eastern European Jews are. I was still at Columbia when Laurie started at Barnard. And I went to NYU Law School as well, but I don't think at the same time. And my father's family fled. It wasn't the same shtetl. They lived in um, a place called 
Golta that became Parvo Maisk, a little southeast of Ostropolia, they fled in the same uh, wave of pogroms the same year. And my grandfather used to tell my father, uh, my father was born there, that, uh, and they fled to Romania first before they came to the United States. And he told them that, you know, the Ukrainian, the Gentiles weren't always that kind to the uh, Yidlach there, but it was the Bolsheviks that, that made them have to run away when they came in, in 1920. And I just want to make one other point. I've worshipped and shopped at Zabar's like so many people here my whole life. But, you know, the, the two more senior people, you've been there a long time. You remember the neighborhood in the old days when there was the pool parlor on the second floor on 79th Street, 2222. And one block north of you and to the east, uh, on the east side of the street was a great Chinese restaurant. I think it was called the Hunan Taste about 50 years ago. And I used to go did there. He, did you have a question? No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to make it. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's OK. Excuse but me. there are, I just want to be able to get to everybody. Uh, um, the neighborhood, well, do you want to talk a little about how the neighborhood no, no, has but changed? We would close the store on Sundays at 6 o'clock. And Saul's family, our family, would go across the street. What was it, Hunan Taste? And we'd have dinner there almost every Sunday. <laughs> Oh, there was a hand up in the back, I think. Yep. I just want to know if years ago, did you buy from the Rigo Park smoked fish house on Cooper Avenue? Yes, uh, we purchased some Connie Spiz at Rigo Smoked Fish, yeah. Middle Village, all the way back by the railroad tracks. And uh, I knew Connie, I knew his son, and... Uh, He's quite a character. He was yeah. en English originally, but a character. Is it still there, you know? Uh, not, not to my knowledge. Thank you. Sure. And do you now buy just from one supplier? Just from? Uh, well, the biggest supplier is Acme Smoke Fish. Mm -hmm. It was in Brooklyn, and as my father mentioned, they expanded factories elsewhere. And we have, you know, we, we, we have other smoke fish suppliers, but they are the largest producer. Excuse me, producer. Uh, I just want to speak up for Sabo and Whitefish. Um, I, uh, I grew up in Detroit where that's where it came from with the Great Lakes. And, um, but I'm wondering where does Sabo come from now? I, 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 think it's, I think it's shifted and I mean, where do you get your Sabo and how do you think about Sabo? And also, what is Sabo? Uh, uh, I'm sorry, you asked the right person, please. Okay, well, Whitefish was always a Great Lakes fish, as were Chubbs, it was a lake herring, which sort of have disappeared, but uh, they, people thought it was a small white fish, but it was a smaller species, of, looked like a white fish. So white fish from the Great Lakes, Zabars historically would get the biggest white fish possible uh, and use the ones that were too big for the counter for our white fish salad. Uh, sable is actually a Pacific black cod, also known as a sable fish. Some men use it as a butter fish. And, uh, you know, historically, most Jewish smoked fish were less expensive species. Sable was not an attractive fish, and it was, it was cold. Not, it, was, it was hot smoked, but, but very gently uh, by the New York smokers. Uh, kippered salmon, baked salmon, used to be a white salmon because it was less expensive. People did not want lighter colored salmon. And... Uh, now so much of it is and now died. it's uh, in in at my time as as a fish buyer in the 80s by 1990 it transitioned into all farm raised starting in Norway and now in Chile and other places and one thing is that when it was all wild mostly Chinook red kings which were big 30 40 pound fish uh, everything was all the catches were in the spring and the summer and had to be frozen and a smokehouse had to invest money in, in frozen salmon for the rest of the year. And now, with farm-raised fish, they could buy it as they need it. So that's a big change. 
So in the fresh market, natural wild fish, the price, as you probably know, is incredible, and no one can afford to make smoked fish out of fresh salmon at this time. Okay, I think we have time maybe for one more question, or this, the white hair. Yeah, that's you. Oh, you're okay. The mic's coming to you, Julie. In the, yeah. It's a question about coffee. Uh, in the 80s, I lived in the Upper West Side, went to Zabar's. Uh, hold, I remember, can you hold the mic closer to your mouth, please? Is this it, ooh, <laughs> too close? OK. Um, question about coffee. Eric coffee in the mid 80s uh, at Zabar's, there was a kind that was called Jamaican Blue Mountain. This has become like incredibly rare. Something happened. Can one of the coffee experts here explain like what's going on with uh, Jamaican Blue Mountain coffee? Remember, uh, our, our Blue Mountain was not directly from uh, the country where uh, with Hawaii, which is Blue Mountain, it was Blue Mountain style. Uh, <laughs> okay, so I'm not sure what year it started. Were we the only importer or roaster in New York? With yes. Saul Zabar, go ahead. Yes, uh, we had we had Blue Mountain uh, for a very short period. It was difficult to get, and the Japanese came in and took up the supply. So uh, then we had to go to Blue Mountain style. But uh, there, we, there was Blue Mountain. It's a, it's a unique taste that I've never experienced before or after. And I was the one that, that actually created the, uh, the coffee department uh, in the sense that uh, I was, had some training with a coffee, a retail coffee producer in Queens. And then I discovered the, uh, the, the way to buy coffee and to, uh, it was a whole learning process. And we do sell, uh, we do sell uh, uh, six or 7,000 pounds a week of coffee and uh, producing some of what I think is some of the best tasting of a certain variety, so. Um, Willie, I wanted to end with a question for you, so can well, you go I, I just want to make a quick yeah. statement <laughs> that, uh, that uh, you heard from Saul Zabar that is uh, will is going on 94 and is in uh, in Zabar's almost every day and uh, so if you want to say that to him. Thank you. Um, so, Willie, you're the social media director. Yes. And at the risk of causing another family rift on this stage, I would like to know um, what kinds of changes, if any, you think Zabar's needs to make moving into the future to increase your you know, global audience. I see you're wearing your Zabar's uh, collab with Vans. Um, <laughs> those are sold out. No, you can't get them. So um, I don't know, where did, just, uh, just to wind up, where do you see things going? Uh, first and foremost, I think we should bring back the novelty magnets. Uh, <laughs> key part of the business model. Um, it's a delicate thing that we have, both from like a brand and product perspective, and you know, we need to make sure we keep doing what we're doing. And the great thing about social media is that it's really, you can use it as a documentary medium. So you're really just recording what's going on. You don't have to make up a story. And the Bernie Sanders meme was just a great day in the history of social media. I'm one of the few people in the world that got paid to make a meme. Thank you. <laughs> That's not true. People get paid to make memes all the time. They're just, uh, they don't have as much integrity, you know? <laughs> buy, it or, buy stuff from our store, all right? <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all so much for coming. I hope you'll join us in the great hall. Thank you.